The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. On a night more than 40 years ago, a Chicago man was inspired by the voice of Woody Guthrie on the radio. Middle-aged and out of work, he gave the station a call, hoping it might just be the place for him to use his talents. Today, several thousand interviews, many books, and a Pulitzer Prize later, we know the man as Studs Terkel, one of this country's most skilled oral historians. Whether his subject is working, race, or the hard times of the Great Depression, Terkel gathers the diverse voices of our country to get to the deeper heart of our history and national life. His newest book is Coming of Age, the story of our century by those who've lived it, as you have. Thank you very much. Welcome to Upon Reflection. If you had a classroom of students and you took away the standard history textbook of this century and gave them this book instead, how different a feel for the century would they have? Well, they might get the idea of what it was like to be an ordinary person living at a certain time in history. It would be the Great Depression. Let's say a guy is coming home, he's been fired. The depression occurred, the crash occurred. He's worked for years at the place, and his son sees him coming home, and his wife does with his tool chest on his shoulder, a carpenter. He doesn't work for the next five years. What's it like, then, to try to find work and not find it? and you're on something called relief back in the 30s, called it welfare today. So they had that idea of this guy then leaving home, sense of failure, bitterness, fight with his wife, gets drunk, as happened back in those days. They might have a better idea of what it is to be on welfare today, not to condemn those in it and say they don't want to work when obviously they do want to work. It's the, it's the texture of history that you've always been at. Is the human flesh and blood feel, not something written abstractly. There was a poem by Bertolt Brecht. We know him best, I guess, for Mac the Knife from Three Penny Opera. He wrote this poem. He escaped Hitler. He was a very biting playwright and poet. And if I would ask you, or others, who built the pyramids, people ordinarily would say, the pharaohs. The pharaohs didn't lift a finger. It was built by anonymous slaves down through the centuries. And so he asked the question, when the Chinese wall was built, where did the Masons go for lunch? <laughs> when Caesar conquered Gaul, and we got that in Latin one, all Gaul divided into three parts, Caesar conquered it. He asked the question, was there not even a cook in the army? And when the Armada sank, the Spanish Armada, and I know the date, Miss O'Brien's class it was. Eighth grade, McLaren School, Chicago. 1588 was the year Sir Francis Drake conquered the Spanish Armada. And today I ask, he did? By himself? You know. And so Brecht asked the question, when the Armada sank, we read that King Philip wept, King Philip of Spain. Here comes the big question. Were there no other tears and that's the history that hasn't yet been written, but is by ordinary people. History of those who shed those other tears, the faces in the crowd, the great many, living at certain times in history. That's the kind of history I'd like to see, in addition to the traditional. This book is about events. It's also about how people feel about being older. And it's sort of a, well, the jury isn't totally in on one side or the other. No. It's about older people. See, coming of age is the phrase used by, by Margaret Mead, the anthropologist. Coming of age in Samoa, it's a classic. It's about young people coming to the age of puberty. And I have coming of age 70 and over. The three score and 10. 
man's span in the Bible has now been extended thanks to uh, discoveries in medicine and to some extent technology. Now it's their story. They lived through most of this century. We got five years ago, the 20th century is over. So it's for them to tell the story. The Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, McCarthy, the 60s, Vietnam, civil rights, the Reagan period that we have today, and the computer. Who best to tell it than those who witnessed it and experienced it? When they talk about being older people mm -hmm. in this country, some people seem happier than others about being older. They're happier with their state of being and with their age. What, after interviewing all of these people, many dozens of people, could, what differentiates between someone who looks at themselves at 75, 80, and are happy about it, and those who aren't? Well, the people in this book are those who are ordinary people, so-called. Some are known people. John Kenneth Galbraith is in it. Uta Hagen, the actress. Jacob Lawrence, the distinguished painter living in Seattle. But the great many are unknown. What distinguishes them from the others is they've been active in one way or another in a world outside themselves, outside their own person, in the community. So the book opens with an introduction by Bernard Shaw, George Bernard Shaw. And he says, my life means nothing unless it's connected with the community outside. He says it, but so does a guy named Joe Begley in the introduction. He's in the book. Joe Begley runs a general store in eastern Kentucky. I was thinking of exactly that. One of the most poverty-stricken areas of the country. Joe says, my life means nothing unless it's part of the community. He's saying the same thing Shaw said. And he says, doesn't he say that with his last breath, with he'll last still be breath, fighting I'll against fight something. Against, against something that I feel is wrong. <laughs> and you see, therefore, these guys and these women have something to say to us, because they were part of the century and tried their best to play some role in making this a better joint to live in. There is a feeling of melancholy woven through this book, but not melancholy for the people that you're talking with. The feeling of melancholy is not for themselves. They, oh, they have rueful moments. Things I should have done, perhaps I might have neglected my own family in these battles. But I've lived a pretty full life, they're saying. But the melancholy is for the young. See, this is not curmudgeons putting down the younger. It's putting the young who have no sense of past no sense of history in some cases show disdain for it because they've been taught this. They worry about the young who are lost and bewildered and don't know where to turn. These are not the yuppies. I'm t the word yuppie is the most overused word about the young. They're the few, you see, uh, the louts, you see, on the beer commercials who have a buck or two in their pockets. The great many young are lost and they're saying, you know what they're saying? I'm not going to be as well off as my old man which is a reversal of the American dream. Be better for my kids than for me. So these people in the book, these heroes and heroines, really grieve for the young. And they try to uh, uh, remedy that, at least to me in this book, by speaking of this history and learning from it. In the, uh, the interview that you did with Jacob Lawrence, it's, it sort of touches on this feeling of, uh, of the young having lost something, and I wanted to, uh, to have you read. I'll pull this little pink sheet of paper Remember, out of Jacob Lawrence had just retired at the time, sometime, as teaching at the University of Washington here in Seattle. And I saw him at his house, uh, a very gracious house, and his studio. And you know there's an artist at work here. He had, a, he had a chisel in his hand, a hand tool. He speaks of hand tools in the hand as a magnificent organism, the hand and the fingers. And he speaks of touch. And he says, touch the hairs of this brush. You feel that? All this goes into my painting, the canvas, the smell of the oil, the paint. Maybe three months or so or six months to work on it. The kids laugh at me. And they say, here it is. Some students feel good about not coming into contact with a canvas or with paper. It's done by machine. They say, my hand never touched it. This is a plus, the way they think. They don't feel the paper. They don't feel the canvas. It's all machine. They plug something in, 
and they can do a portrait by computer. A student can come back that same day and bring you a portrait of yourself without his having laid a finger on the brush, on the canvas or the paper. He hasn't seen you breathing, blinking, nothing like that. The air all around you is not there. There's no space. Throughout our history, these have been important factors in the making of a work of art. Hammer, chisel, that Jacob Lawrence had in his hand. Feel the hairs of a brush. They don't want to be accused by their peers of succumbing to this human thing, touch. They'd be ashamed. Distance has become a plus to their peers and to themselves. Maybe one day, We'll live in a world of robots, a world of mechanical devices. Fortunately, I won't be alive. I feel this way more now than I did a few years ago. I feel this drawing back. And to me, he said, distance has become. Now, you watch, you go to any city room of a newspaper. In the old days, there was a noise, there was an excitement. I don't mean the front page, that's an exaggeration. But there was this telephone calls, human voices were heard. Today you go to a city room, and there you have young reporters, male, female, sitting next to one another, watching that thing, that computer, looking at the window of that terminal. The word terminal <laughs> is a good word. And there they are next to one another, yet they're planets distant. They're nowhere near each other. And it's as silent as a tomb this aspect we're talking about. Do you think that the, um, the relationship with technology, the, uh, it, it, hasn't it gone around, though, generation to generation? I mean, can't you just hear someone saying, the horse and buggy, why, that's the way you should go. These cars, they're noisy. Yeah, I'm not saying that, no. Of course there's progress. Of course, by the way, the computer has done things. It's brought facts we couldn't get before quicker more, more, more quickly. There's a friend of mine, I uh, haven't seen him in years, Norris, what's his first name? I'll think of it in a minute. There again, see, things I'll talk, <laughs> we'll talk about memory in a moment. And he's from Nebraska, and he says we're more and more into communications, plural, but less and less in communication. And that's what these young people next to one another are all about, too. I'm not against, I'm not a Luddite. You know, Luddites were the agriculture workers of England who destroyed machines because they're putting them out of work. No, we need a washing machine. Although not, not a couple may not need a washing machine. It makes noise. But we need a washing machine because I don't want to see a woman or a guy hit wet cloth against a rock, you know. We need uh, a refrigerator because uh, where else am I going to freeze my martini glass, you know? <laughs> so, so, but it, there may be a point of no return in the love of machines, replacing what is naturally human, the touch. There's an older doctor in the book talking to a young intern about their patient. How did she do last night, Miss Smith? And the young intern says, just a minute, Doc. And he punches into the computer. And he gets the latest lab test, right? And he looks at it and says, hmm, she did fine, it's okay. That's not what I ask. What did she say to you about that pain? Was it different than the pain she experienced the night before? He says, oh, I don't know about that. You don't? Why did you become a doctor? A doctor, I became a doctor, the old boy says, because of the laying on of hands, the touch. Now that may be. Even the sound of the human voice, the voice, I used to call up a guy named, say, Charlie Miller. Is Charlie there? A human voice answers, well, Charlie's not here, but uh, I said, could I leave a message? Sure. What do you So now I call, Charlie Miller there? It's not a human voice that answers. It's a mechanical voice that says, if you want personnel, press one. If you want so-and-so, <laughs> press two. By the time you get to six, where am You're I? You're worn out. You t you'd like to talk to people who have a lot of fight in them. Who are people that you wouldn't talk to, who you wouldn't consider talking with for your books? Well, anybody is eligible, I think, if that person has an insight into himself or herself or feels something about something outside that person's being. And the, not all people are the same, not all are exciting as other people. But the people I talk to are not the celebrated ones, these few exceptions, because they fit into my book. 
In the main, they're the many who are heroes and heroines, maybe in the community. Very often, I, this woman will say, you know the person you ought to see? Florence. Uh, Florence. She lives at the end of the block. Now, Florence is not a big shot. She's not an entertainment tonight. She's not a meet the press. Florence is a community person who's able to say something the others may feel but can't say, who has that certain insight, yet she's an ordinary person. And so it's the Florences of the world I seek. When I was reading the, your book, I was trying to figure out how big it would be if the full conversations of all these people were in it. How much you had to oh, clean well, that's out to the make part. the book. That's <laughs> known as now making a book. Prospecting. See, you see, so I talk to a person, there's a tape recorder, and then it's transcribed by someone. And I say to that someone transcribing it, people I admire, by the way, one of them is doing a book on her own now, Sidney Lewis, and she's very good. Well, I say, put everything down, L even the pause, and a certain laugh. It may be a laugh at a strange moment. Why? For example, African-American people now and then laugh in recounting a bitter moment. It's kind of a safety valve. The old blues song goes, laughing to keep from crying. Or today I say laughing to keep from raging. And I can name cases of that sort, friends of mine who experience humiliation and laugh at that moment. I say, put that down. Well, at the end it comes out a lot of pages, and a lot of it is the fat and you have to cut the fat out and keep the lean. This is the delicate part. Here, the truth of that person must be highlighted, and you can't distort it in any way. I use only their words. Uh, my words are in the introduction, or in the in introduction of the book, or in the introductions of each individual. Otherwise, it's their words. So I'm like a uh, gold prospector. Well, gold, we heard of the Klondike, you know, of Alaska, before that, 1849, California, Sutter's Gold. And so the covered wagons went out there and they dug and dug and dug. I hear about a certain person who may be gold and I go to see that person. And now the gold prospector digs and digs and digs and I talk and they talk. And out comes for the prospector tons of all kinds of ore. And out come these 50 pages. Well now, you're not going to have the ore, you can't. You've got to sift the ore. And then he's got a handful of gold dust in his hand. I've got to edit and cut and change. And out comes these eight pages of gold dust. It's still not a book. So you have to, how does it become a gold watch or a necklace? And so you have to work things together. You know, I work things together and there's a book. When you did your first um, oral history, Division Street, it was 30 years ago or so now, the way you described yourself then, you said, you said, I was out to swallow the world. Mm -hmm. Do you still have that same appetite? Well, sure, but I got the appetite, but not the energy. Not as much <laughs> as before. You can't. Then you realize it's impossible. But you try to swallow as much as you can to give you an idea of what the world is like through these, capturing the thoughts of these people. What is it like to live at a certain moment in history? Mm. And I always wonder, I got an idea saying, I would like to live, to have been there with a tape recorder on Good Friday, 1995 years ago, at the foot of Calvary. Now, why did I have this thought? Because in one of my books, there's this Catholic grandmother, Jean Gump, who became worried about nuclear missiles and her grandchildren. She was very respectable, active in her community, a suburb of Chicago, head of the PTA, head of the church group. And Jean Gump one day, believing in Christ, that is, love thy neighbor, one day she went out with a couple of young Catholic activists, disciples of Dorothy Day, to one of these missile sites in Missouri. and decided to hammer at it, didn't do any damage, but they spilt their blood on it and they sang their songs and they called up the military authorities that they're there to be arrested because they want to publicize what they're doing. And the military authorities came and they heard a voice in the bull bullhorn with a personnel on that missile site, step down with your hands raised. And here's Jean Gump, <laughs> this grandmother, very gentle and very witty, with her hands raised and there's a young soldier trembling with his gun aimed at her because she's the enemy. My God, enemy of America and <laughs> defense. And here's Jean Gump and she's about, 
her nose begins to sneeze and she wants to blow her nose. So she reaches into her purse and the kid says, don't you dare move. She's, Sonny, he's about the age of her grandson. I'm going to blow my nose. And he says, don't you, he's so scared of her, you see. She says, well, shoot if you must this old gray head, but I'm going to blow my nose. <laughs> well, then I thought, this kid, this kid with pimples and acne, a sweet little boy, the soldier, so scared of her, come, cut back to Good Friday, 1995 years ago. This young Roman soldier with acne, with pimples, with his helmet, he's, he's taken some little boondock somewhere in Thrace by the empire. And there are these Christians, the sect, the subversive sect, the subversive of the empire. Empire says, conquer by God and overcome. And they're saying, love thy neighbor. And there's their leader about to be executed. And there's this kid terrified. And a couple of old soldiers are shooting dice for the robe and the sandals of the guy about to be executed with loaded dice. <laughs> and then there's the crowd itself. The great men are turning away. They don't care one way or the other. And then there's the informers. One guy informed and before the House Un-Roman Activities Committee, and he finally hanged himself in the garden. And then there's the judge, Pontius Pilate, and he's washing his hands. He's just a hack judge, doing his job. And then his wife, who's a good person, says, leave that good man alone. And he says, will you stop nagging me for Christ's <laughs> sake? That's the only time the phrase was used properly. Well, what it would be like to be that young soldier then, to be a member of the sect then, the subversives at the time, to be the judge, to be the wife, to be the many. That's the kind of history. Mm -hmm. And then you learn from that to now, and you it, connect that with Gene Gump today. It reminds me of a story you told in, uh, in talking to myself about it. Being a, I think you called yourself a linguistic chameleon, how you, you adapt to the environment that you're in and, and sort of love to get out of yourself and soak into Yeah, my wife points that out. She places. can tell I'm talking to her on the phone by the way I talk, <laughs> out of hearing. See, well, once I, I once did a program years ago, radio, pre about Jimmy Durante, about his life in the Italian community in New York, and Umbriago, the little legend, the elf, an Italian legend, his mother would sing him to sleep. So I'm reading this to Jimmy on the phone. I had to read it to him for his permission. And he said, that's great, kid, that's great. So I start talking to you as I'm talking, bit by bit as he's saying, keep going, kid, that's I say. But listen to this, Jimmy, here's the way it goes. And she said, we're talking to Jimmy Durante, weren't you? Yeah. And there was a writer friend of mine, Nelson Algren, a marvelous writer. Nelson, that's the way you're talking slowly like that. And so I say, well, anyway, what do you think happened after that? She says, give Nelson my best regards without hearing his name. So I am a chameleon in that sense. In the, uh, in the introduction, I mentioned uh, the night in Chicago. You heard Woody Guthrie on the radio and thought, well, it sounds like a pretty good station. Maybe, maybe I can actually mm -hmm. do something there. That was about halfway through your life when that happened. Yeah. Halfway I'm, between when you were born and sitting in this chair. Well, I was blacklisted because I have a big mouth. It's McCarthy <laughs> days about signing petitions. And I signed petitions against Jim Crow. That's the phrase that was used then before the 60s. Petitions for price control, rent control. You're a troublemaker. They, yeah, well, they say, are you a commie or something? Signing these things? I says, no, but I'm going to sign these things. Well, some of the commies may have started this petition. I don't care if they started it. it says, if they came out against cancer, do we come out for cancer? What is this? Are we going to be in their, in their thraldom? You see? Is it right or wrong? So I signed, so I never apologized for it. And so I, I blew my jobs that way. And one day I was listening to this radio station that playing good music. It became the best classical music station in the country, WFMT. And I've, with them, I've been with them now 43 years. That was 1952. And I heard Woody Guthrie. So I used to do a disc jockey show. I'd play folk music and jazz and opera, everything. And among them was Woody Guthrie. I was the only one who played Woody Guthrie, but here they're playing, and I'm, so that sounds good. So I call up, I say, I'd like to work for you guys. And they heard of me, and they were delighted. They say, it's great, except for one thing, we're flat broke, and so am I, so we're even. And that was 43 years ago. Hmm. I know you, you could have headed in a lot of different directions. I mean, there are sort of these moments of serendipity in life where, where things come together as, as you and WFMT. One of the most fascinating job opportunities that I, that I read about you having was as a fingerprint 
identifier at the FBI. Were well, you? <laughs> I, I've just done a book. that I finished the book several years ago, but it's been reissued. It's called Talking to Myself, and I've added... <laughs> There's an afterword of about, about uh, 30, 40 pages. I kept trying to imagine you well, sitting here, and looking at the these fingerprints. It was the Depression of 1934. And the thing to be desired most is a civil service job. Nine to five security. And I took an example, something called fingerprint classifier of the Department of Justice. In this case being the FBI. 1934. And I passed, pretty good mark, and it was going to pay... Uh, 1260 a year, which is the second lowest, CAF2 it's called. And I'm all set. I was interviewed by Melvin Purvis. He was the oh. bureau chief of Chicago, the man John, who John captured, Dillinger. killed John Dillinger. And of course, John Edgar Hoover hated him for that because he got all the publicity, you see. Hoover, as you know, was quite a publicity hound. <laughs> and so uh, I found my, uh, not found, I wrote away for my Freedom of Information files. And here I found something I'd forgotten all about. I wrote long-handed letters to the FBI, the director. He always calls himself the director, Hoover. Where's my job? Because Melvin Purvis gave me a good bill of goods, and in it it says, director to the controller, line up me, my name, for this job. Okay. And then I come across another thing in the FBI. It says... The name is blacked out. I know it was a professor of law at the University of Chicago. Somebody who didn't like I you. attended the law school. I don't know why I did, but I did. And he <laughs> says, the blacked out name says, a sloppy man, an average student, interest only in criminal law. And uh, the last part is, not the highest type of boy. The next piece of information in the files is, from Hoover to the controller, cancel Lewis, that was my name, Lewis Turkle. It's, that's the nickname. Cancel that hit. Because I discovered, we just found out, he's not the highest type of boy. And then there's another letter from me, longhand, to the Honorable Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, accepted by Louis McHenry Howe, his appointment secretary. And I'm complaining about the dilatory behavior of the director. <laughs> and apparently they send these letters, you know, form it to them. So I got a letter back that had a show of distemper from the director to me saying, we do not tell people why we do not choose them. And suddenly I realized I'm a suitor, an ungainly suit according a debutante. <laughs> and then I said, if only he, I about to say she, but I shouldn't, if only he were less diffident, I might have wound up Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. See? Or Clyde Tolson. And we end and as, so and we, end as we began, been. a simple twist of fate. So that twist of fate. Absolutely. Studs Turkle, I want to thank you so much for spending a half hour with us thank on Upon Reflection. Much. Coming of Age, your newest book. Thank you. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.